Well, good morning. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It is a great day to be gathered here in worship this morning as we gather to sing songs of praise, hear the word spoken, and share in holy communion together. You know, I had a thought this week, and I didn't run this by Catherine, so I might get in trouble afterwards for this one. You know, sometimes I do let the intrusive thoughts win. So on Tuesday, I was at the gym. And I usually go to the gym about the same time every day. And Tuesday afternoon, it was incredibly crowded, like more crowded than I've ever seen it uh, in the over a year that I've been going to this gym. And I went back on Thursday afternoon at the same time, and it was virtually empty. So I was standing there thinking to myself, I, I thought about this all weekend, and it finally hit me this morning what had happened on Tuesday. See, Tuesday was the day that all the people who said they were going to go to the gym at the beginning of the year for their New Year's resolution were trying to get in their first gym workout of the year. And Thursday, it was the same people who gave up going to the gym for Lent. Like I said, I, I didn't run that one by Catherine, so <laughs> it is a great day to be here this morning. Do have a couple of quick announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, first of all, in your bulletin, you'll notice a special insert today. Uh, this week and next week, we'll be taking up a special offering for the Week of Compassion. The Week of Compassion is the mission arm of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. There's some information in there um, for you pertaining to what the Week of Compassion does. If you would like to make a special offering this morning, we ask that you write uh, WOC in the memo line of the check or grab one of those special offering envelopes, uh, and you can put your offering in that this Sunday and next Sunday for the Week of Compassion. Also coming up this week, uh, NFL is going to be meeting on Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday is our newsletter deadline. Uh, so if you have anything for the March newsletter, Wednesday is your day to have it into the church office. And then following worship next Sunday, we are going to be watching, uh, having a time of movie and fellowship uh, here in the sanctuary. We're going to be watching the Sight and Sound Theater's production of Samson. It's a great show. If you guys had the opportunity to come last year uh, to our movie and fellowship, it was a great time. So after church next Sunday, we'll have some snacks, some, some popcorn, uh, maybe some finger sandwiches. If you want to bring some cookies, you're more than welcome to bring some cookies to share. Uh, and we will go out and we'll fill up some plates uh, and then we'll come back into the sanctuary and watch the movie. Uh, it'll be about two hour movie, so we should be out here about one o'clock. Uh, but the movie will start at 11. So if the preacher goes long next week, the... Anyways, I don't have any other announcements this morning. Bas I do have one more. Basket Bonanza is quickly approaching. Uh, and so if you have uh, any questions, I think they're up to 258. Okay. So 258. You know, I told them they were going to get to 500, but uh, we might have to do some church counting, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> we are, it is a great day to be here. Uh, let us stand and enter into worship together as we sing our opening hymn uh, in body and spirit.
Please remain standing and join me in the invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Loving and giving God, we are gathered this morning on this first Sunday of Lent as a family of believers who hold as our core belief that you are our God and Christ is our Savior. Join us now, gracious Father, as we worship you with our song, our prayers, and our words. Hold us close so that we may feel your presence among us and so we may know that you will sustain us in this troubled world. As we continue our worship, Father, hear our prayer as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite all the kids. We're going to be right over here this morning, guys. Stetson. We're going to be over here, okay? We're going to stand up today. I want to invite all the children now to come join me right here up front for children's moment this morning. We're going to stand right here, okay? All righty. So I have a challenge for you this morning. Do you guys like challenges? No. No? Okay, well, you know. That's cool, too. All right. I want you to divide yourself into two groups. Okay. All right. So, so look at these groups. She's a princess. Two groups. Okay. No, I'm the king and you're the prince. All right. So here we go. So we got we got we got a group right here. We got a group of four, and we got a group of two. Okay. But here's the thing. I'm only going to talk to these two. Is that okay? Okay. So today's Bible story is a story about Jesus healing a woman's daughter who is sick, okay? And, and the woman comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, will you heal my daughter? And Jesus says, no, I'm okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, right? <laughs> no, that's not true. Eh, eh, maybe. Okay. We'll read the story oh, in Sunshine. Tired. He was tired, that's right, okay? And so, but he said to them, he said, it, it, it's only good for me to talk to the children of Israel, okay? okay. So everybody else can kind of just be by themselves back here, right? <laughs> okay? How does that make you all feel? Left out? Bad? Yeah, kind of sad. Yeah? A little cuckoo, yeah. All right, so that's the traditional interpretation of the passage. But here's the reality. Jesus actually says at the end, he says, everyone is blessed. Everyone is a part of the kingdom of God. So no matter if you're in this group or that group or in the choir or in this group back here or in that group back there, everybody gets to participate in the kingdom of God. Awesome, right? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for coming before us today and, and, and allowing us to participate in your kingdom no matter who we are or where we come from or what burdens we carry in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have fun in sunshine time.
as we do come to this time of sharing in uh, prayer for not only one another, but also for the prayer needs that have been spoken and unspoken within the life of the church, I would ask that you continue to keep uh, Bev Stratton in your prayers. Bev had a little accident this week and broke her kneecap, but I talked to her yesterday, and uh, for those of you who know Bev, she was full of energy and spirit and, and was telling me about how she can get into her car even with the broken knee and, and how God is still good. So we give thanks for that, but we do ask that you keep Bev in your prayers uh, during this time of recovery. Let us go to the Lord our God in a time of prayer. Merciful and everlasting God, we come to you on this, the first Sunday of the Lenten season, recognizing that this journey that we are embarking on is a journey that comes from you, that originates in the halls of heaven that has been decreed and was spoken before time itself was recorded. We begin this journey, O oh God, appreciating the moments of opportunities that we have for pausing and reflecting upon the way, the way to Jerusalem, the way to the upper room, the way to Golgotha and an empty tomb on Sunday morning. Creating us, O oh God, during this Lenten season the opportunities within ourselves to be more reflective, to be more focused and attentive to the needs of others around us, but also the desires and whispers and hopes of our own hearts and our own souls. Allow us to deepen our relationship, and our understanding with you. Allow us to seek truth even when it hurts and to look for hope and joy all around us. We continue, O oh Lord, to pray special prayers of healing and comfort and wholeness over those who are listed in our prayer concerns. And we know, Lord, that there are also many prayer concerns unspoken this day. And we ask that you, that you would reach out your hand, your spirit, and continue to touch us anew, bringing healing and wholeness in your way and your design. Allow us, O oh God, in this journey of penitence, this journey of reflection, to center ourselves and to focus on you and the calling that you have entrusted it up, entrusted to us to share the good news that the kingdom of God has come near this and every day. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen. amen.
matter what the test.
Our scripture reading this morning is found in the seventh chapter of the gospel according to Mark and begins with the 24th verse. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house, but he did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at the feet of Jesus. Now the woman was a Greek, Born in Syrian Phoenicia, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply as this, you may go, for the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. May we hear this as a living and faithful word this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our salvation. How did this scripture reading hit you this morning? Just out of curiosity. Did it give you the, the, the warm and fuzzy feelings like, you know, Caitlin breaking the all-time record from half court? Did it fill you with that kind of excitement? Not quite, yeah. Me either. Did it, did it make you feel like, oh, this is such a, such a friendly story to tell all the children about? Dogs and breadcrumbs and who's in and who's out. You know, sometimes we read something or we experience something that is so out of place, so out of, uh, out of context, out of the nature of what we know to be the reality and the truth that what sets in is a little bit of disillusionment or disenfranchisement. Now, the scripture reading this morning truthfully does not really sit well with our embedded theology of Sunday school Jesus. It doesn't fit well with our embedded theology of, of, of skateboard Jesus. It really doesn't fit well with our embedded theology of let the children come on to me and they'll sit on my knee and tell me what they want for Christmas and that Jesus. This Jesus seems a little preoccupied. This Jesus seems a little bit um, angry. This Jesus seems a little bit annoyed. This Jesus seems a little bit judgmental. This Jesus seems a little bit like he didn't want to be here on Sunday morning. This Jesus seems a whole lot like us. I don't know if I like that feeling either. I can understand why that doesn't quite sit well with our being, with our embedded theology of of who Jesus is. I mean, we, we, we're allowed to be angry and annoyed and inconvenienced and judgmental and and, and all these things, but the author and perfecter of our faith, the Christ, the Son of God, not so much, right? I mean, didn't God say that 
He loved the world so much that he sent his son into the world to save the world, that whoever believes in him should not die but have everlasting life. For for God didn't send his son into the world to, to condemn the world but to save it through him. And a woman comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, will you heal my daughter who is sick and possessed by a demon? And Jesus says, no, I'm good. Thanks very much. Maybe if you try peacock. (laughs) That's not biblical, by the way. (laughs) I don't know if I like that, Jesus. I don't know if I like the way that makes me feel. Never mind the fact that if we actually look at the biblical narrative, that immediately preceding this journey to Tyre and Sidon, Jesus was dealing with a whole bunch of religious folks who were telling him that, hey, you may be the son of God, but you really don't understand the commandments of Moses. Not only do you not understand the commandments of Moses, you really don't understand the law of God. You don't understand what defiles you. See, that bread that you eat, because you didn't wash your hands, that bread that you eat defiles you, so you are unclean. Yeah, you may be the son of God, but you're unclean. Never mind that part of the story. Never mind that Jesus says to them, it's not what is on the, what you eat, what you take in that defiles you. Rather, it is the condition of your heart, the condition of the soul. It is what comes out of you that defiles you. Never mind that part of the story. Never mind that after Jesus explained all these things in parables and teachings to the crowds and to to the religious leaders, that his disciples, his his trusted friends and advisors and, and, and close confidants come up to him and say, so what were you really talking about, Jesus? To which Jesus replies, are you so dull? Never mind that part of the story. Never mind the fact that Jesus left that place, that he was teaching and preaching and sharing the good news that the kingdom of God has come near, that it's open and accessible to everyone, that everyone can be included, whether you eat clean food or or drink unclean food. That you are welcome in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God has come near. And he left that place. And he went to Tyre and and, and Sidon. These cities were held in such high regard that they're compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that's like... The Mount Rushmore of excellence, right? Never mind that part of the story. I just don't like the way Jesus talked to the woman. I don't like the way it makes me feel. Sometimes, the biblical truth, the word of God makes us feel uncomfortable. Sometimes, believe it or not, the word of God tells us to do things that we think are a little weird, a little crazy. Sometimes, God's word says to us, you are the one who is guilty 
You are the one who should be listening. But we don't like the way it makes us feel. So we choose to reinterpret it or reimagine the story in a way that is not true to the actual biblical narrative if we just opened up our Bibles and read and understood a little bit and looked at the gospel not as individual parts but as a greater narrative of God's love, God's redemption, and God's salvation made known to mankind in Jesus Christ. but we don't like the way it makes us feel. Throughout my life, and I'm gonna guess probably most of y'all's as well, the only way that I have ever heard this passage interpreted is that in this story, the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus is acting like a donkey. And I did check with Catherine. I'm, I'm good. Okay. You know, I was, I was thinking about how I was gonna, how I was gonna phrase this. And, I, and, and by donkey, I mean the three-letter kind. I watched a PG movie a couple months ago with our nephew, and I, and, and times must have changed because this this movie that was a, a family movie it gave me nightmares. <laughs> okay, it was it was a little rough. That Jesus. It, 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 is acting like a donkey. And not for the purpose of, of carrying the good news, but rather just because he can be. And I don't like the way that that version of Jesus makes me feel. And I guess that you don't like it either because you're sitting here on Sunday morning wanting to know more about how you can become a bigger part of the kingdom of God. If I don't like the way that makes me feel, then why have we collectively allowed that to be the normative and dominative narrative of interpretation for this passage for all of our lifetimes? We're all smart, educated people. We, we all know how to read, or most of us know how to read then why would we accept something that is counter to the very narrative and the truth that we know to be the biblical truth about Jesus Christ? I think it's because we've never been told by a preacher on Sunday morning or by a Sunday school teacher that there's another way to look at it. So I'm going to tell you something. I may not be 100% right, but I want to offer you a different way to look at this passage this morning. Because this traditional interpretation, is, it's wrong. It's a fallacy. It's a red herring. It's a, it, it's a slippery slope. It's, it's kind of dull. That is what Jesus said. So let's look at this together. Verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. So you're telling me that Jesus, after dealing with a bunch of religious folks who were telling him what was clean and what was not clean, went to the land of the Gentiles. Now, for all of those who are keeping score at home, what were the Gentiles considered? Unclean. Okay. Interesting. So Jesus goes to the land of the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles really don't get along or live the same way. Yet Jesus is intentionally going to this place going out of his way to travel 
to the vicinity of Sidian and Tyre. Huh. And what's interesting is that even in this place, even in this land of the Gentiles, the Gentiles know who Jesus is. Not only do they know who Jesus is, they've heard about what Jesus is teaching and preaching. Not only have they heard about what Jesus is teaching and preaching, they've heard about what he is doing. How he's made the blind to see, the lame to walk, and casting out demons in the name of his father. Verse 25 says, in fact, as soon as the woman heard about Jesus, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Huh. On the surface, it would seem that this is setting up a normal healing story. We've already heard five, six, 20 of them in the gospel of Mark. You know what's going to happen. Jesus is going to look at her and go, your faith has made you well. Get up, walk, be sick no more. That's what we're expecting. And yet, we get a twist. Verse 26 says, the woman was a Greek born in Syria and Phoenicia. Now, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Huh. So you're telling me that someone who is unclean, who's not of the Jewish faith, who's not of the same ethnicity, not of the same gender as Jesus expects to be welcomed and accepted and included in the kingdom of God. Huh. It's interesting. Mark tells us that the woman was a Greek. Matthew's gospel tells us that she was a Syrophoenician. Now, most of us would hear this, and admittedly, we won't connect the dots. What's the difference between, say, a Syrophoenician woman and a Roman centurion? Well, first of all, gender. Second of all, money. But third of all, who they are descended from. You see, the Syrophoenicians were descendants of a very specific group of people called the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanites were descendant of a guy by the name of Canaan, who was the son of a guy by the name of Ham, who was the son of Noah. Now, what do we know about Noah. Well, God kind of got upset with the earth. It was a little judgy, right? And said, I'm going to wipe out all the waters, but I'm going to set my bow in the sky as a promise that I will never again flood the earth. The only problem is that we know the people immediately fell back into what? Sin, ill refute, defiling God, and who happened to be the chief perpetrator of this? Ham, the son of Noah. Remember how Jesus was just talking about what defiles us doesn't come from the outside, it comes from what is on the inside? See, God destroyed the earth. God sealed up the ark. Surely the ark was 
full of right and morally uplifting people who would only do God's commandments. And yet, as soon as they got off the ark, well, people were back to their old ways. So this woman was a descendant of the Canaanites, the ones who broke the commandments of God, the ones who defiled the ark. Now, the Canaanites became a nation, a nation that worshiped many gods, not just Yahweh. And we know the story, how it goes from there. The land once again became corrupt, and then God found a man that was pure in heart named Abram. In Genesis 15, God made a covenant with Abram. He said, to your descendants, I will give you this land from the wadi, that is river, of Egypt to the great river, to the great river of the Euphrates. And then he goes on to list the land of 10 different nations. Now, I would stand up here here and pronounce them all, but I worked on them all weekend and... Anyways, listed in that list of 10 nations is who? The Canaanites. Huh. And it is to this land of the Canaanites that God says to Moses... You will lead my people to the land that I promised Abraham and to Isaac and and, and to Jacob. You will lead them into this land that is a a, a promised land. A land of of milk and, and, and honey and you will live in covenant. And in relationship with me and I will be your God and you will be my people. And I will gather you in. Like a mother hen gathers in her brood. And you will come and you will build a temple for me and you will worship before my mountain and and everyone will live in in peace and, and harmony and righteousness and follow the laws that I have inscribed to you on these two tablets of stone. And then Moses comes down off Mount Sinai. And the people are what? Sinning, defiling the very name of God, taking this this promise that God has given to them, that God has called them holy and chosen and and beloved and set apart and go like this. Ah, we're good. I'm okay, God. Um, I don't need laws and rules and regulations and commandments and ordinances. It doesn't make me feel good. I'm going to do what I want. And so it is to this land, the land of the Canaanites, this, this promised land that by the leadership of Joshua, because you remember this whole part about the people had to wander until this corrupt and defiled generation died out for 40 years in the wilderness. So it is by the leadership of Joshua to whom God says... As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, for I will never leave you or forsake you, for be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people into inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give to them. By Joshua's leadership, the people of Israel enter into the land of Canaan. See, God's promise, God's covenant was with the people of Israel. No matter how many times they sinned, no matter how many times they built a golden calf, no no matter how many times they faltered and split themselves and let their temple get destroyed because they weren't listening to God, God said to them, I will keep my promise to you. I will keep my commandment to you. I will keep my covenant, my promise with you. For you are my people, holy and chosen and beloved and set apart. The people of Israel were to be first. And everyone else was to be 
secondary. Yet Jesus, Jesus here in the Gospel of Mark goes to this place, this land of the Gentiles, this land of the Canaanites, the sworn enemy of Israel, to this place that is compared to the very cities that God destroyed because they were so evil in his sight. Jesus goes to this place so he can act like a donkey? No, no, that's not right. Jesus goes to this place to bring the kingdom of God near, even to those who don't look like him or smell like him or believe in the same God as Jesus Verse 27 says, first let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and to toss it to the dogs. See, it is not right for me to speak the world's word to Israel. God has made a promise, a covenant with the nation that they will be first, that they will be holy, that they will be beloved. I must go to them first. But I'm not only going to go to them. And the woman responds, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Translation, there are those out here among us who we may not be holy and chosen and beloved and set apart, yet we believe in what God is doing. We believe in how God is moving through you. We believe that God is important in our lives and we may not look like everyone else and we may not worship the same on Sunday morning as everyone else does. But we're figuring it out. We're trying. That counts for something, Jesus, right? Jesus says in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, if anyone hears my word and does not keep it, I do not judge them, for I did not come come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. It is the word that I have spoken against them will be their judge on the last days. See, Jesus didn't go to this place to judge the woman or to have a bad attitude or or to act like a donkey. Rather, Jesus went as a pack mule, carrying the good news of the kingdom of God, bringing the promise that, yes, you may not be holy and chosen and beloved and set apart, but the kingdom of God is still for you. You are still welcome among this table because I eat with people who defile themselves. I eat with sinners. I eat with lepers. I eat with folks that everybody else says, you. And I say, you, you are welcome and loved and chosen because you believe in me. You have heard my word spoken, the word of truth, the word of righteousness. And you have said, I believe in the word. And because you believe in the word, On the last day, on the day of judgment, when I will decide who is clean and unclean, who is defiled and who is undefiled, my word stands as a testimony to you on your behalf that you are part of the kingdom of God, not only here on this earth, but also in the one that is to come. See this story. 
the story really isn't about the question that's being asked. It's not really about Jesus' response either. That was simply a test of faith. What the story is really about is how Jesus once again defied expectations, defied political borders, religious understandings, and went to where the people needed to hear the word the most. Where the people needed to hear and experience the living word and the kingdom of God. And because of this action that Jesus takes, not only here, that Jesus continues to take throughout the Gospels and, and, and in a few short weeks when we get to, East, to Good Friday, the action that Jesus takes on the cross, we hear those words that God spoke so long ago to Joshua, to be strong and courageous for I will never leave you or forsake you. We hear those words and we realize that they are words not only to Joshua and, and, and to the people of Israel, but to all of God's people all who profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the one and only Savior of this world. That's what the story here in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark is really about. May we hear this once again this morning as a living word for each of us to carry forth this day. Amen.
It is recorded in God's holy word that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks for it, he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, take and eat, for this is my body that has been broken for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he blessed it and then he gave it to them and said, take and drink, for this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant that is poured out for one and for all. So often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to this, your table on the first Sunday of Lent, we remember the love that you poured out through Jesus Christ on the cross. As we partake of the bread and the cup, symbolic of his body and blood, we profess that through his death and resurrection, he defeated death and sin, and that he brings eternal life to us as believers. As we share this communion meal with each other, we remember and we renew our commitment to live a life of discipleship. And we affirm our Christian faith as we continue to prepare. I believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I seek to follow him as my Lord and Savior. As elders, when it's our turn to, to serve and to give the stewardship moment, uh, the pastor sends us a note and tells us what the sermon title is and what the scripture is. And it's usually pretty helpful. <clears throat> but I've got to be honest with you, this week or this past week when I got my note and said that the sermon title was Dogs and Breadcrumbs, I was a little uh, concerned uh, about how to, how to deal with that. Um, and tie that into stewardship. And uh, I, I worked on that pretty hard. Like a, you know, a faithful Christian, I, I turned to my Bible and, and looked for help. And uh, in particular, I looked at the scripture that uh, the pastor had sent and that he uh, um, described for us today. And, uh, and I went to a commentary because it wasn't really easy uh, at, at first, as he's pointed out. Um, I, I was a little uncomfortable, as, as he's pointed out <laughs> before also. Um, but what I was able to determine was that um, basically, and I'm happy I agree with the pastor, uh, that the good news of Christ is not just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles, it was for everyone, everyone who is a believer. And so in the story, um, it's, it, again, it's not just for the Jews, it was for the mother and the daughter, it's for you and it's for me. Christ's good news is for all of us. And I think that sets a, a nice pattern for us, uh, and this, here's where I'm stretching, uh, it sets a nice pattern for us uh, in our giving that we should look to everyone uh, as the recipients of uh, our giving, of our tithes and our offerings. Uh, it's not just what uh, we need here at Norwich Christian Church to meet our needs, but our, our offering, our tithes, our uh, time, our energies should go to help not only ourselves, but to our neighbors, to our communities, and, and to the world. So as we offer our tithes and offerings this morning, I'd ask you to keep that in mind and uh, follow the dogs and crumbs teaching, uh, and let's give for everyone. I will now receive the morning offering. Gracious and giving God, we're grateful for your love and for your blessings. 
that are so bountiful that they extend to everyone. Help us to be loving stewards of the resources, time, and energies that have been given to us, and to do our part in extending them to all those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If there's anyone here that's new to the community or yet to establish a church home and you feel that God is calling you to become part of this family of faith here at NCC, we invite you to do so as we extend the right hand of fellowship as we stand as we're able in body and spirit and sing our closing hymn, which is, thank you very much, Karen, 562, Be Thou My Vision. this benediction. Thus has said the Lord God from on high, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I have drawn you unto me and I will continue to set your hearts on fire with my amazing love. Amen.